Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Rising Tide Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Mo, and I am uh, here in a very special series called Conversations with Candace, Insights into a Championship Season. And today, we're delving into the world of strategic approaches to game planning. Joining us once again is the very brilliant Coach Candace Motes, who, uh, with her tactical prowess, uh, led her team to victory in the 2023 NAIA Women's Volleyball National Championship. Coach Motes, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks, Mo. It's good to be back with you. I'm excited. Yeah, so let's let's jump right into it. Um, so today's episode, Candace, it is titled uh, Strategic Approaches to Game Planning. And so can you share with our audience some of the strategic decisions that were key to your team success during the championship season last year? I, th- I think, Mo, I'd be happy to share. I think that uh, one of the things I'm going to say is that it started at the beginning. Um, I don't think you can, like, all of a sudden gear into the strategic planning mode halfway through or even towards the end, n- seeing maybe where you're headed. So um, kind of a theme that we uh, really leaned into was out-team our opponent. And what Hmm. I mean by that is that we wanted to build a culture that was so strong that we were teammates, that we respected each other, that we were doing this for each other, that we were leaning into something bigger than ourselves together. And so that's what I mean by out-teaming our opponent. We we did not want to get beat by things that were in our control. We wanted to get beat by maybe better teams, better skill sets, but not to be fighting, not to be selfish, not to be attitude issues, et cetera. So we started that right away. Um, It was kind of a conversation that we started out, and then uh, we delved into doing this by going on a missions trip, uh, which really centered around serving and gave us an opportunity to, again, do something bigger than ourselves. So going to the Dominican Republic was a opportunity for us to learn how to serve others, how to be uncomfortable, how to assist each other, especially the freshmen that just were starting out, you know, they, they were homesick while they were in the Dominican Republic. And it's like, uh, you can't just really call your parents, you know? So (laughs) our team really had to be the parents really had to be the big sisters of the freshmen. And that was really cool to see how they took that responsibility and made it something that was their, their charge for the leaders on the team. And then just doing the service that we did, uh, the smiles and the encouragement and the excitement of watching kids that were less privileged than us and being able to really see the value of our sport and how it can change lives. And so that was really cool. So that set the stage. We came back and, you know, you get back to uh, your grind. You get back to all of the things that uh you maybe are not necessarily always excited about every day, especially when you don't have school. You're just only eat, drink, and sleep volleyball. So we tried to, this is something too I did that was very different and probably one of the only coaches maybe in the NAI that uh, did not do two a days during preseason, which is a very familiar process that we, we usually do as coaches. Um, I did one a days. Uh, on the court, which inspired and brought energy to the practice. It was, we're going to give everything we got because we know this is our only practice. We're going to, we're not going to overload ourselves. We're going to just lean in. Other parts of the day were then put towards, again, the culture, um, out teaming, building that piece that we really wanted to build so that we could go in every day and be as selfless as possible um, as human beings, right? <laughs> we have those those challenges. But um, I think that was really where we started, Mo. The strategy of that was the beginning of our whole process 
of course, you know, as you keep going along and you keep seeing maybe some results that are happening that you really didn't even realize could possibly be happening, um, you never know. You know, you think you got a good team, you think you got good talent, but never know what you really have until you kind of go against your opponents and you see what they have. But as we continued our success, uh, one of the strategies that we implemented again was, okay, I think there's levels of letting go of self within the season. Um, I think you start out and it's real easy, you know, to, oh yeah, let's just be selfless. Let's, everybody's, you know, on this team for a reason, da 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 and as much as that's true, the doubts and the tiredness and all those things start to make people spin and go different directions. So if you're not playing as much as you thought, that level is then a, ch a challenge again to say, hey, you know what? You got you to gotta stick back to what we were talking about. We need to out-team our opponent. So that means that now you're going to have to die another level. You know, you're not getting what you want. So you have to die another level. And then we get along a little bit further and, you know, it gets deeper in the season, more schooling, more tests, more projects, all of those things start to come. And there is another level. And I think that at that point, it's the real decision. That's that's where you really decide. Do you really want to stay together and out-team your opponent? Or do you want to give in or quit or, you know, not keep going forward? As much as people want to quit, you got to figure out as a coach how to help them not have that mindset. You got to help them realize this is so worth because I think struggle mo is what really makes you strong, what really makes a strong team. I don't think building culture is easy. I think it is a okay. very, very hard task. And the more you go into the season, it gets harder. So I, I answered that question in a lot of words, but um, I just really believe that that's really the strategy that carried us to probably the level that we got to this year, it it was that we figured out for this year, because not all years has happened, but we figured out this year how to out-team our opponent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear a little bit uh, more of that. I, I've been taking notes as you're talking, I mean, from the beginning of the process all the way to, you know, as you go through the, the middle of the season, uh, I hear a lot about um, culture uh, as we've talked about uh, over the past year or so um, levels. Uh, I, I love that. Um, but levels of, of self and now teaming your opponents uh, dying a little bit more. Uh, I think, I think you were, you were talking about as things get, get tough. I mean, dying to self um, and becoming more of a team uh, that that's all, that's all great stuff coach. And I guess my, my question to follow up is talk to me about, uh, when we're talking about strategic approaches, you know, when you're thinking about a game, talk to me about the, the ability to adapt and adjust a game plan based on your opponents. Because for our listeners uh, who haven't looked at Candace's um, record for this, that championship season, it was undefeated. So, Coach, you didn't lose a game. And I think that was the first time of that uh, I remember in some 30 plus years or whatever that. Um, this has happened. Uh, has it ever happened? An undefeated season at Iowa? No, <laughs> no, it has not ever but happened. No. <laughs> but no, ever. But no, it has. It has happened. That's right. It happened. So, um, it happened. So, <laughs> so, coach, on the way to that undefeated season uh, and winning the championship, what did you do to to adapt? Because I, I'm guessing, and I kind of know this, uh, so it's kind of a, a I'm, I'm kind of cheating a little bit here. Because you and I would have conversations before all your games, and you say, oh, no, I don't know." So, uh, you know, what what were the the changes? How did you adapt? What did you tell your team? What did you do in the game planning process to make sure that you were ready 
through all these trials and tribulations during the season? What did you do? You know, Mo, I I came to a realization on how I was viewing our team versus the opponent. Um, really interesting piece to me that maybe uh, I didn't recognize before. I look, I watch a lot of film, uh, just probably too much. I wouldn't recommend just 124 hours watching film. <laughs> I need, okay. I'm a visual learner. And so for me, uh, watching film was uh, my calming method, I think, uh, to help me know, hey, I'm ready for this. But um, I think one thing that I started to recognize is when I started to watch the film and started to see where they were scoring and how they were effectively matching up with possibly us, I was always looking at, oh, you know, we got to, we got to stop this girl. We got, she's way better, you know, or, oh, we have to, um, I don't know if we're going to be able to do this. And that's probably why you heard me often go, oh, I don't know, Mo, this could be the time, you know, um, it's going to, it's going to be a disaster. But <laughs> what, what I think, what I think I recognize is that, um, you know, over the years of watching the sport and watching success, um, I, I kind of identified a few things that I felt like were in our level were very effective. And we just leaned into those three things. Um, in the volleyball world, uh, if you can serve and you can pass in system, better than your opponent, you are going to have the edge. If you can side out right away by passing in system and getting a kill, you're going to usually win your set. And so what we did was we started to identify what are the things that we feel percentage wise that are helping us to get to another level of possibly winning the game. And it didn't have anything to do with what they had on the other side. It had everything to do with what we could do to serve and get them off the net, how we could get in system so we could get three options, and then how we could side out and put a kill, first kill it down. And that was, that was our whole strategy. We served incredibly well. We outserved our opponent throughout the season. Um, there were more out of system. And when you get an out of system set, you can't effectively put a ball down as hard. And you also can predict from your side of the net, you can predict where the ball is mainly going to go because you don't have as many options. If you get a ball passed right to the setter and you got your three options available, it's not going to be uh, as easy as if we've limited it down to one or two options. It makes it a lot easier. Um, we also tried to take out the best player in each rotation. So if we took out that player, we made other players have to touch the set, had to hit the ball, and we were prepared for we said, hey, we stopped this player, but we're going to challenge the other two to beat us. And that helped us a lot because uh, usually in each rotation, there might be one rotation out of six that you'll have your heavy hitters in, in the front together. But most of the time, you have one really solid player in the front, and then your two others with that player are usually... If you run a 5-1, you're usually just going to have the setter in the front. So then you've got two options. So, you know, we tried to match that up a lot with, okay, they got two hitter front right now. We're going to put our three hitter front in, challenge them, and that's going to take away the setter. If the setter's small, that's even a bigger advantage for us. Or if they run a 6-2 where they have three hitter options the whole time, who's the best hitter? We're going to stop them, and then we're going to challenge the other two to beat us. So that was kind of our whole plan throughout the season. I, it's really not rocket science for us. That was really what we did. Wow. I mean, that's great to hear. And seriously, Coach, you say it's not a rocket scientist, but 
I, I was thinking to myself, this is rocket scientist for me. I mean, as a, as a swimming and diving coach, <laughs> I, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, what is going on here? No, no wonder uh, she knows all this stuff. She, no wonder you have to, to watch as much film as you do. And I know that your assistants uh, are wonderful. We'll talk about, um, you know, the, the way that you incorporate assistants uh, in a later episode. Uh, I mean, coach, do, my, my question is, do your players know all this? Do, like you're thinking about, I mean, you're playing, you're playing chess here, uh, and, and and you're thinking about, um, like you, you were you uh, pass in system. I was thinking, well, what is that? And then you you broke it down a little bit, and it makes sense to me. I would assume that your players, do you communicate this to them? Uh, for our coaches out there, uh, they might be thinking the same thing that I'm thinking, which is, do the players need to know this, or is it just? You need to know it. You need to know that you're looking at the film. You need to know that you know where these things are and you just help them. You direct them or are they, are they, how much of, of how much of a part of the process do they need to be a part as opposed to just going out and doing their best? Um, you know, Mo, I've learned over the years that more is less. So if you bomb people with a whole bunch of information, like there, there are personality types that I want to know everything. I want to, I want to know this. I want to know this, you know, what is, what is we need to do here? <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. And if they're that way, they'll come in privately and sit down and say, okay, in this rotation, what do we need to do? Mostly it's the setters. The setters want to know more because they want to be able to set the right people. They want to know who's in that rotation, you know, and of course you're gambling because in volleyball, uh, you know, like in basketball, you can start five and you just know, OK, those five are usually the starters and they're just they're just on the court, you know, and they never change positions or whatever. But right. when you're in volleyball, you have like when you're in volleyball, you know, you can rotate the wheel. So you think you're going to say, oh, they're going to start this way, but then they can rotate back and they still have the players on the court, but they don't have the players that you think they have in that particular rotation and once you put your lineup in in your rotation you have to stay in that rotation for a set then you have to outguess your opponent but to answer wow. your question um the big picture pieces are what people usually want to know so for example everybody gets the concept serve tough everybody gets that okay that's not anything you gotta like plan for or whatever. So in practice, they know serving is critical. They also know in-system passing. So those pieces are already known and they're just big concepts. The small pieces, the details, they want to know, because here's the cool thing, is that most of the players in a volleyball and NAIA mainly, because we have unlimited subs, which will probably blow some people away, is that you only really need to know mm. three rotations. So when you're in that ro three rotations, here's what you need to know. Here's what you have to do. And that really is, you can comprehend. This player is in this rotation. She'll be in three times with you. Okay, well, she loves to hit line, but we're gonna stop her line. We're gonna make her hit cross to our stronger defender. So all you gotta do when you're in the front row is block line against this player. All you gotta do, if you're the setter in that rotation, all you gotta do is set away from that player. Cause she, we know that she's a good blocker. We know we wanna hit at her. So she has to do something before she loads up to go out and hit, makes her slower. So yes, they have to know the details of their specific rotations. But I do not, of all that, that I or Dan have in our heads, absolutely not. The, that would just be on overload. It's usually <laughs> we're anticipating a lot of things um, that maybe don't even ever happen. Maybe a kid was hurt that we didn't even know was hurt through the week and now they're not in. You know, and then we're like, oh, we spent so much time preparing for this player and now she's hurt, which, you know, it's it is the game. So I give them enough 
And if they want more, they come in and ask. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Well, uh, that, that, so I have a, a question that's going to lead into my next um, a big question. And the, the question I had is during, during play, do, are you yelling these things? Or the, are, the, are the girls yelling to each other what to do? Or just everybody knows what, what they're doing? I've also learned this, that if you can't prepare your, your players to be able to go out and play the game, then you have a bigger problem. So I expect my players to know the strategy and I expect, so our back row has a job. Our back row has a job to help the setter. So when the first touch comes from the back row, the back row's eyes don't look at, oh, how did I do on my pass? You know, did it go to the setter? Did it not? Oh, bummer. Yay. It's, it's, Okay, now I've cast the ball. I know where it's going. I am now looking across the net. Where is the defenders mm. going? Where Where is, based on my pass, if it's in system, if it went right to the setter and our setter does not have to move, well then, is our middle staying there or is our middle sliding over? Maybe let's say I have my best All-American in the front row. Is my middle edging over to my best hitter? And if she is, the back row is saying back, which means to the setter, set back because the middle has committed to a particular direction because your whole goal is you want, if the back row gets a one-on-one -on -one block by helping the front row and helping the setter, then the back row gets a point. That's our, that's our system. You get a point because you got the point by giving good information. And our back row is also mm -hmm. heading in because they want to form a circle around the hitter that if the hitter does get blocked, they're able to pop it back up and then load up again and help the middle, help the setter again, know which direction to go. So they are talking to each other all the time. And the front row is listening to, let's say they went to the back. Okay, that's one directional piece, but then they're not done. The back row is now saying line or cross. So what is the opponent's block doing? Is the opponent's block blocking them line because they don't want them to hit the line because maybe their defender isn't as good? Or do they want them to protect the setter so the setter can leave early and not have to dig a ball, which makes them out of system? So as you're working your, your strategy and you're working your offense, you're always trying to get your opponent out of system. So that means try to hit to the setter, try to tip to the setter, try to, try to create opportunities where the opponent is off the net and not able to stay in system to make it hard to transition back at you. So the back row is talking. So my job, is initially through the first three, six rotations, my job is to chart, where are we hitting? Did it score? Did it not score? What are they doing on the other side? Are they blocking line? Are they blocking cross? Are they transitioning in the middle? Are they transitioning to their best hitter? Are they hitting back row? What are they doing? And we're charting it for one, six rotations. Then from there, we're deciding that's where the coaching pieces come in hey in your rotations three rotations you're in player a i want you to hit cross because they're blocking you line and they're trying to protect their setter so go in there and let's move around and let's hit the gaps and let's go into the deep corners of um we have our court numbers on our court so we'll say go in and hit to five you know, which then is a directional piece for them. But to constantly talk to them, it, especially those that personality types are like, you told me one thing and that's all I'm thinking about right now. You tell me three, four more things, I'm on overload and I didn't even hear what you said. So I think coaching them off the court is much better and let them play on the court when they're there. I think there's too much information that we try to give them and really it's just get your preparation in line so you don't have to sit there and mm. talk to them the whole time that's my opinion 
of what I've learned because I used to do <laughs> ongoing conversation yeah. and it's exhausting for me too. Yeah, that's great coach. And and I have a question on that. So um, you had some, some games um, or some matches uh, this, uh, this past season that were, um, you know, easier than others, some that were tougher than others, but talk to me about adaptability being, um, an invaluable piece of the puzzle when it comes to high pressure situations. Cause I know you had some high pressure situations. So can you elaborate on, on how your team approached overcoming adversity, particularly when it seemed like maybe a time you can give us a story about when you, you felt like you were losing control within a, within a match. Do you have any of those this year? Yeah. So there was a lot of pressure, Mo. Um, the deeper we got into the winning streak and we didn't just win. We were not even losing a set. And so people's goals weren't always just to come in and beat us. They were just trying to get a set. Oh, we got one set on Indiana Westland, you know, <laughs> I think <clears throat> as, as we continued um, to fight off the best of the best, because everybody plays, you know how it is when you have nothing to lose. You come in, uh, you're you're the underdog. You're gonna you're gonna play at a higher level, absolutely, because you're the underdog and you have nothing to lose. One thing I realized is that there's a lot of pressure on certain people, and that's where our out team, our opponent, came really strong. We had to rely on more people than just our stars. And they had to know that we relied on other people because if you're if you're out teaming your opponent, then you have to make everybody believe that they have a piece in the process. And if called upon, they can come in and they can really help out in the program. And that took a lot of risk because you know, when you're not when maybe you're in a situation where you feel like you're not going to pull it out or you're feeling a little bit like, oh, you have to trust that what your gut's telling you to do is probably the right decision. The good thing about volleyball mm. is you can play 25 points and you can lose in a 25 point set and you only lost one point. So if you're already going south and you go, why might, why would I just not try this? Or I'm going to just put this person in because maybe they're just hungry and they're ready to go in. I had a situation at one of our conference matches and it was a, a two and a half hour, three hour drive. Um, our opponent was... Uh, our opponent was not necessarily at the bottom of the conference, but down in the bottom four. Everybody's tired. Everybody's like, you know, sleeping on the way. And there's not a high amount of, uh, I would say, energy going into the match. You know, it was just kind of like, well, we're just going to go through the motions, get this one over. We got to play it, et cetera. So we go into the first set and we beat them 25 to five, just kill them. And okay, I, that was better than I thought. Um, so we go into the second set and we can't score a point. We cannot score a point. We're, it's 13 <laughs> to one, them. And wow. I'm just like, what is happening? You know? And so there was a lot of, of, you see your true colors coming out, you know, and you're in a stressful situation and then where humility Absolutely. is not, you know, and selfishness steps in and all this, this junk that gets in the way of team. And so at that time, you got to make a decision. Okay. The kids that are on the sidelines have played their, have practiced their guts out, have given everything they can to this program. They may not be as skilled as the ones on the court right now, but the ones on the court are really losing their focus. And so I started subbing some because I thought, well, if we're going to lose, you know what? I'm going to give these guys a shot to see what they've got. <laughs> Absolutely. They yeah, yeah. brought energy. They 
came in, they were talking, they were inspiring everybody else on the sideline. And I, the only thing I did when I turned over to look at the people that were out is like, you better cheer your guts out because that's what they do for you this whole season. Yeah. And so they got, right. they got off themselves. They started cheering for their teammates. They were excited. They were glad they were out of the pressure. They weren't playing well. They were getting refocused in their minds. We did not pull that set out, but we were like fighting back and we were getting the momentum, which is really what you want to do when you're in a situation where you're going into another set. You, you want to be high energy and you want to believe again. So these guys really brought that. Well, then we got into the third set and the question kind of was, okay, I'm ready to go back in, you know, I'm ready to do this again. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're ready to cheer and you're ready to help this team win this game. It's just not like, about yeah. you going back Absolutely. in. It's about right. everybody on this team out teaming our opponent. And so they went back in and, you know, they did their best and they hung in there and they just barely won that third set, but they won it. And so I put them back in fourth set and um, there was only one player I put back in um, just because I needed that player to believe in themselves again. And, you know, just to not get too far south because I knew what was coming next was a really big opponent and I needed that player to really have the mindset that they were okay. Right. And so I put one player back in and we ended up winning the fourth set. And, you know, here's the, here's the crazy thing, Mo. We won, right? We walked away with a W, three to one, with high scores from our opponent, which everybody's like, oh my gosh, did you see the match against Indiana Wesleyan and, you know, their opponent? And, um, and I was like, who cares? Who cares? These kids got a shot. They right. showed their true colors. They were able to build a team culture and we were stronger because of it. So that, that wow. to me was a win bigger than even on the scoreboard. You know, I think coach, those are, wow, th what a great story. And I, I, I haven't heard that story. Um, and so I appreciate it. There's always something new, uh, especially from a championship season. So thank you for sharing that with me and for uh, our audience and for those young coaches out there. You know, you you talk about uh, you know giving putting these these girls in situations and helping you know, switching things up, the the things that people don't see behind the scenes of coaching. Which I know there's always a lot of second guessing uh, for all of us coaches. Somebody will look at you and say, "Well, why did they?" There's always a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks. A lot of you know uh, people that say, "Well, I would have done it this way or that way or whatever." Now, in, in this case, coach, this season. You, People can look back and say, well, obviously she made the right decisions because they went undefeated and they won the championship. But let me ask you this. Did you, throughout the season, uh, face an occasion where the odds were stacked against you? And, you know, that, which is really an opportunity to um, show resilience and rise to the opportunity. And as you talked about adversity, but was there a time, Coach, um, in the season, uh, whether it's the first game or the last game or anywhere in between, where you just thought, wow, the odds are stacked against us and now it's time to go. And what did you, what did you tell your team and, and, and how did you overcome that? Because obviously you overcame every obstacle to win the championship. But did you ever feel like that? Oh, Mo, well, you know that. I, every time um, I went into, especially at the, the championship, our, our hurdles in the way were huge. Uh, I, I really even think that the Raiders from the NAI were thinking, there's no way, you know, Indiana Wesleyan's going to win this. I think that they felt we were overrated hmm. all the time. And this is, this is bummer for me to say, but I did too. And that hmm. that's just wow. part of where I, I really self evaluated myself. Like, wow, why would I even think that, you know, was that, to just self-preserve or was that uh, honestly not believing in my team? Um, what What's my issue? So I, that's part of my off-season work is I'm just really trying to evaluate myself and go in healthier in this next season. But I think that um, 
the biggest thing that you can do for a team when you have a lot of talent is to help them believe in themselves and to help them believe in each other. And I, I really believe that the things that we told them when we were reaching the quarterfinal, which was the national champion from the year before, the semi, which was the wow. team that was always frustrated that we were ahead of them, and the team that was in the championship, which was number one in the rating, um, is that we had to believe in ourselves. And even when we felt that hmm. if we were down, if, if we were losing the set <laughs> or, or getting cremated, that we had to believe that if we could give ourselves to a bigger purpose of what we're trying to do, and that was to out team our opponent and to give ourselves completely to, to God, completely play for him. And that's what we even have on our rings right now. Um, we, we have on our championship rings for him because we went in to every match and we decided this is this is grace and complete blessing at this point and so god we are grateful we are thankful that you're allowing us to go into this opportunity we want to shine for you we want to represent you we want to be everything we can by out teaming showing that culture is number one and that the culture being number one is because we love you and we love each other. And that's our charge. And honestly, Mo, I don't think there was anything that we had to do different. I mean, besides specifically looking at each team and going, okay, this is what they got. This is what we need to do. You know, the simple strategic pieces of just breaking down an opponent's game and helping my team know what to do to counter it. And what we could do to score was that you have to come in with the mindset today that you are capable and that you are a championship team. And that was the work. That was the work through the last, I'd say, five days of the tournament was we are here and we matter and we can do this. And I believe even in the championship at the final set, when we were tied and we were switching sides and I told the girls, this is gonna go either way. It's two to two, it's gonna go either way, but I'm gonna tell you that we are gonna stay on task for what we set out to do. And that is that we are gonna surrender this to the Lord. And we, this was our third level of surrender. Mo, everybody, everybody had to believe. And I took a couple starters out in that set. And I was really, wow. really in my heart going, man, they better, they, they, they better lean into this because if, if they weigh on the kids that are in there that haven't been in there as much, you know, they're, they're going to, there's going to be mindset issues. And I just, they leaned in Mo, like you wouldn't believe. And I think the people that did not play or the people that were going through the biggest adversity within that match were the ones that helped us win the set and win the game because they chose to go to that third level of surrender that I'm going to pour myself into something bigger than just how I'm looking how we're doing can we win this game i hope we do it's going to be a heartache if we don't we came this far all the fears that can spin you out on things that, that you have no control over the only control you have is to believe in yourself pour it out and give everything you've got to what you're doing and trust that it's enough and if it's not enough you did everything you could and so it went our way. It went our way. Now, how would we have felt? How would I be talking to you if we wanted to won that fifth set and lost the match? I would have said to you, Mo, what a heartache. <laughs> what a heartbreak. But we found joy 
And I will remember one thing that my international told me who came to our program this last two years that never really knew what it was to play for the Lord. She didn't get that. That wasn't ever yeah. something in her teaching and her coaching. And she came in and she said to me, coach, I'm so happy and I'm so calm. I just, I just want to go out. And she was laughing. She was having a big smile on her face. She was just, I believe, pouring it out for something bigger. And she lost herself in that. And that was huge, huge for her. And it was life-changing for her. And I'm excited for that. And I want that to be the reality for all my players. But it takes hardships. And it starts even at the very beginning. Are you going to quit as a freshman because you didn't play? Are you going to stay in the hard, hard journey to get to the another layer of letting go of what you're not getting and just keep fighting because the adversity makes you stronger and you're going to get stronger and you're going to be prepared to go into playing a sport today that needs a mentally tough person. And the only way you're going to do that is not having an easy road. It We never get stronger, Mo, when it's easy. And we complain a lot. We get frustrated a lot, um, you know, <laughs> you and I might try to like help each other through some, some junk that's going on or whatever. But if we're honest with each other, those roads are helping us get stronger and we're better people because of it. And that's really what I want to be is try to just find something that is the best of me and not just stay stuck because really it's not helping me. Um, I'm just, I'm stuck, you know, I want to be bigger and a better person. Wow. Well, thanks coach. And, you know, before we conclude, uh, do you have any final thoughts or advice for our listeners out there, especially aspiring coaches who may be facing, facing similar challenges as, as you did uh, this past season and continue to face? I think that I would encourage uh, coaches if they're young, don't quit. Just it's it's not easy and there you're it's a lonely it's a lonely road a head coaching role is lonely you might have been the teammate and had fun and then you maybe are the assistant and everybody loves the assistant and then all of a sudden you become the head coach and you're calling the shots and everybody doesn't want to talk to you anymore they feel <laughs> you know like every time that you ask them for coffee it's something issue that you got to talk about and they don't really want to be your friend right. because they're not sure if <laughs> you know you really really are doing them right and it, it can just get a lonely road and just don't be don't be afraid in the loneliness of the challenge of that and just stay stay strong, find the people around you that are going to encourage you, find people that are going to help you. Um, I, I have those pieces, Mo, you're one of them that just, you know, you, you just reach out and you just try to find people that are inspiring and, and that keeps you going. So I would say to all of us that if you really have a passion, love, love what you do, because it's your passion. Just love what you do because that is the most important thing. And then you can stay strong in the adversity of it all. Um, not saying that you're not going to have those breakdowns, which I do all the time. So I'm not perfect, but um, <laughs> it has grown me a lot. Coaching has grown me a lot. It's made me a better person and stronger person. Well, thanks coach. I, I really appreciate that. Um, words of wisdom, uh, indeed. And, uh, thanks again for sharing your invaluable insights with us today and to our listeners. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in to the rising time leadership podcast. Uh, and then next time we're going to continue to explore leadership excellence through, uh, what I'm calling conversations with a champion coach Candace Motes. And until then, Keep striving for greatness and never forget to lead well. We'll see you next time.